Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining today's webinar. Uh, I'm Andy Sherritt. I'll be hosting the session. Um, we'll get started. There's still a number of people joining, not least our Improvata colleagues, who I think are having some issues actually joining as uh, panellists. So we may have to change the order around a little bit. Uh, so just bear with us on that, please. Um, but yeah, thanks again for all of you that have turned up uh, on time. Um, we are here today to talk about Improvata Mobile and how that relates to sort of NHS in particular. And Paul from Morecambe Bay has very kindly joined us uh, to share what they're doing. Um, usual housekeeping bits. Um, we will be recording the session. Please do ask us questions in the chat and I'll be monitoring those throughout. Um, and also we'd be very grateful if you could um, complete the survey at the end of the session. So um, we, we normally do a round of introductions now, just so you can put some faces to names. Um, however, as I mentioned at the start, we are still missing <laughs> significant significant number of the panelists uh, in Pravata have so far been unable to join. So it's just myself, Andy Sherrick, Head of Business Development here for now, and also Paul Lewis. Um, Paul, do you wanna just say hi to everyone? Yeah, afternoon guys. So I'm a server and desktop infrastructure specialist at UHMB. Great. So yeah, but Paul um, is currently implementing the, the main solution that we're here to talk about today. So that's going to be hopefully quite interesting for you guys to hear about. And as I say, please do fire questions in and then I, I can fire them at Paul or, or answer them myself if I can. Um, so before we lead, before we kind of get into the main subject of the day, I always like to just give a very brief overview of IT health, uh, just in case people aren't overly familiar with us as an organization. Uh, we are NHS cyber specialists, so that's all we do. Um, been doing that for a long time now, 30 years or so. Um, we've got a, a, a portfolio of solutions and services that are all geared towards helping the NHS with those challenges around cyber and assurance and compliance. And I won't go through them all, but um, they're, they're kind of summarized on the screen that you can see there. Um, and yeah, we work with partners who we feel complement us and who we feel are a good fit for the NHS. So most of those will probably be quite familiar to you on the screen there. Um, notable ones, all of them really, we, we, we work very strategically with all of our partners, um, but a couple to mention would be the relationship with Landsweeper and how that feeds into our assurance dashboard. Again, lots of you will be familiar with that already. If you're not, please let me know. And also, again, many of you have used and do still use our Securit two-factor authentication solution. And, and again, at the risk of re repeating myself, um, if that is a requirement for your organization around secure access, two-factor authentication, uh, using NHS smart cards, um, please let us know and we can talk to you about that on a, on a separate occasion. Uh, but for now, today's session is, um, going to be focused around Improvata and the work that we do with Improvata in the NHS, particularly around mobile and sort of device management. Um, so uh, I can see that Andy has joined us. Uh, Andy Wilcox from Improvata. How are you doing, Andy? Hi, Andy. Yeah, good. Thank you. Apologies for the uh, slight tardiness of turning up. Um, we've had some technical problems in our, at our end yeah. with a third party IT system, which has stopped us all connecting. I figured that it was uh, technology related, so yeah, not to worry. You're here in the nick of time, actually, because I'm li literally just about to pass. Have you, you padded for as long as you can? No, 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 no padding at all, I promise. Um, so right, I'm just, we're just trying to get the, my other colleagues on at the minute. So um, I will, can I, if you just bear with me while I just send a link. Yeah, that's fine, just, um, yeah, just, Put yourself back on me. I've, I've actually got one more little bit to say, actually. Go for it. I'll let you carry on for a second, there, Andy. Thanks a lot. So yeah, um, apologies, everyone, for the uh, slight chaotic scenes here, but I think it's just uh, about they were getting blocked from joining. But yeah, I, finally, what I wanted to say before I hand over to Andy is that um, we have over the years built up quite a large number of Improvata customers and reference sites within the NHS. So. Some of those you can see on here. Um, I'm sure some of you work for some of these organizations that are on the webinar today. So 
yeah, most notable ones for today's topic, I would say obviously Morgan Bay. Paul Lewis has very kindly joined us to share what they're doing um, around mobile and ground control. And one of their neighbouring trusts as well, actually, Blackpool Teaching, have also recently launched into a, a similar kind of project. Um, so those are two of our newest sort of Improvata ground control customers, which is the, the specific technology which we're here to kind of share and talk about today, really. Um, so that is all I've got prepared. Um, now I was going to hand you over to Andy Wilcox and my colleagues from Improvata. Andy, are you good to go? Uh, I am good to go. So you've got the slide deck up, haven't you, Andy? I have indeed. So I, what I'm going to do now is give you keyboard and mouse so you can uh, you can control now. I'll go, I'll go on mute for a bit. Over to you, Andy. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, um, welcome to the webinar. Thanks for the introduction, Andy. Um, I'm Andy Wilcox. I'm the Senior Solutions Marketing Manager for Improvata, and fingers crossed within the next 10 minutes I'll be joined by my colleagues Victor Pizzolato, who's our Global Solutions Manager for Mobile, and Dan Johnston, who I'm sure many of you will know, who's our, our UK Clinical Workflow Specialist and has met many, many of our, our customers over the years. So. Um, Obviously, this talk's going to be about mobile, and um, what I wanted to do, first of all, is just do a little bit of scene setting on you know, where we've got to, why uh, mobile is increasingly becoming important, and you know, how it's fitted into the NHS, and, and how we can support you in that journey to, to using mobile. So, uh, Andy, um, oh, there, there we go. So, yeah, we'll just... Um, over the next 30 minutes or so, um, I'll just talk a little bit about that vision. Dan's hopefully going to be online in time to talk a little bit about that clinical perspective. And then Victor's going to kind of go through the solutions that we have before we um, before we hand over. So without further ado, um, I mean, you know, we've been all been in, in healthcare IT for a long, long time. And we've seen the, the rapid and you know the, the, the changes that have happened over the many years. Uh, and we've moved beyond that case where you know, we were all working in the hospital, we were all using thick client computers and thick client apps, and, it, and there was a very limited set of people that were actually interacting with um, patient data, the clinical record. And we're now in a, a, you know, a much more complicated world where there's a vast array of different people that are accessing all of that data that we have on patients, and not just from the hospital anymore, but out on the road, from clinics, you know, using telehealth platforms, and you know, particularly over the last two years from the home as we've all been forced to, to kind of work from home. And what that's led to is a, a, an expansion of the type of devices that we, we connect using and access data using. So we're, we, you know, we've spread, moved beyond the, the traditional kind of desktop computer to thin and zero clients. Users are accessing using their own personal devices at home, and what we're really going to focus on today is that that mobile device that we're increasingly seeing used to facilitate paper free at the point of care, particularly. And what that's also led to is a, an expansion on the type of applications that um, are used to access that data. But right at the centre is still that core thing that that drives all of this access, and that's the digital identity of, of the clinicians who are accessing it. And you know, from an improvised perspective, we've seen, you know, we, we listen to our customers, we, we see how our technology is being used, and what we all often see is the frustration associated with it. Why does it take so long to log on? Why do I, you know, ha why can't this be easier? Why do I have to enter usernames and passwords all the time? And these often act as a barrier. So although the intent is good to, to provide better layers, layers and levels of security to the data that we're trying to access, the barriers that that layer of security adds are you know, frustrating for clinicians. They, they can impact on adoption and really the, the, the benefits that we're trying to bring through technology. And that's you know, part of the reason why Improvada built our digital identity framework a couple of years ago, which was to kind of look at identity in a much more unified manager, manner across the whole organisation. So how is identity being used? How is, is, how is it facilitating care? And, and what can we do to make that 
much much easier for um for all of our clinicians all of those users to use and and that you know there's a multitude of different areas that identity touches from you know the moment a clinician arrives and that join and move a lever process where they they want to get onboarded and get access to all of the, the solutions and applications they need as quickly as possible. And then all of the controls that we need to put around that access. So what are they permitted to see? When are they permitted to see it? How are they permitted to see it? And then moving on to the more of the kind of operational side is, is how are they accessing data? What applications, what devices are they using, particularly mobile now, as we've seen a huge expansion of mobile devices in the past kind of five years or so and a much more interest in, in finding how mobile addresses workflow existing workflows or opens the door to new workflows to deliver care more efficiently and effectively but also when we think of um, identity from a, a kind of a security perspective we will have to be you know acknowledge the compliance that needs to go hand in hand with that access so we look at something like the NHS Data Security Protection Toolkit, and identity is really kind of baked into that across numerous different sections of it. Oh, if I, sorry, this slide builds, so we'll uh, just let it all come out. But particularly in relation to mobile, I mean, there are several sections now that explicitly reference mobile, the need to, um, for you as an NHS organization to minimize risks if devices are stolen by putting in in place the necessary uh, kind of protections whether that's um, pin codes or or other kind of technology to ensure the device is secure how do you manage the the software the operating systems that are on the devices and ensure that they're up to date and, and then patched and uh, yeah, other areas like you know managing device security centrally so not leaving it to individual devices but to control that through central management solutions but all of this is, you know, we're talking specifically about mobile there, but identity really is, is touches on many, many different areas. And, and you know, if you think about Improvata and where we started was in single sign-on, right in the middle there, Improvata one sign that everybody knows and, you know, many people are using. But we've, ex you know, acknowledging how many different areas um, identity touches, we've expanded our product portfolio to support that. And that sits now across the, the identity governance piece, so that join and move levers, privileged access management, re-authentication workflows, monitoring of how access is being used once it's granted. And what we're particularly going to focus on today, which is the mobile piece, which is uh, on Android devices, mobile device access, and more specifically on iOS devices, so uh, through ground control. But what this kind of demonstrates is how integrated all of those solutions are. So that, you know, when, when we've developed and acquired, it's all been about how we can integrate to provide a unified solution to help address ident the identity challenges in healthcare. But what I want to do now is hopefully my colleague Dan's online. He is, hopefully you can hear me. Brilliant, that's great to hear Dan. Um, I'm going to actually hand over to Dan now because he he's going to talk through a little bit of the clinical perspective of, of leveraging identity effectively and efficiently on at, at the front line of healthcare. So Dan, um, do you want to give me next slide and I'll click through? Yeah, sure. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I'm going to kind of uh, just introduce that kind of clinical perspective and kind of pull it uh very appropriately and it's necessary to be re regulatory compliant and also uh looking at all the technology but what does all of this mean clinically and what does it mean at the bedside um uh, being able to provide care if you can click to the next slide andy that would be great um healthcare settings have an increasing array of mobile devices which we're all too uh familiar now with and they're becoming um they're crucial to automate certain functions, to undertake point of care testing, as well as input data in an increasingly digital environment, particularly as uh, NHS organizations and trusts gradually kind of build um, in advancing their digital capability. And the most meaningful way to understand and appreciate how mobility is impacting patients is just to really specifically look at their care and what does it mean for clinicians to provide care with these mobile devices and by that i mean kind of 
understand the patient's journey and the clinician's workflow. And that's essentially where I'm always working from um, and um, really kind of speaks to the success of any technology uh, once it's addressed regulatory compliance, once there's technical integration, the real success sits in its usability uh, with healthcare staff. So by referencing journey and workflows, I mean it literally moves through the steps that healthcare staff undertake in wherever they are providing their care. And that could be in the most acute settings of emergency departments and critical care, where I often uh, still practice, or through to general wards and outpatients and hospitals, or even um, making sure that we're inclusive of co colleagues within the community, rehabilitation services, um, and out in health and social care. So it's really uh, the applications of mobile devices and being able to sign into these mobile devices are increasingly relevant through acute services to secondary care to even patients' home and virtual wards. So these devices consist of a plethora of functionalities, be that kind of tracking patients' uh, parameters, uh, dispensing medications, uh, recording observations. It just shows you how crucial and how usable and kind of adaptable these devices need to be when kind of making sure that we're staying focused on patients and the people that we're providing care on. And by that, I think I'm also meaning its usability, essentially. And the usability speaks to the ability to be able to access your electronic medical record system, um, to be able to interface and work with your electronic prescribing medicine administration systems, as well as support um, greater capabilities, whether that's to leverage the idea of kind of early alert systems um, and location-based systems and any number of much further along digital capability. Um, that are, is being offered in more advanced digitally mature systems. So staying with that usability themes means that amongst the first steps in all of this means that we need to know who, what, where and when uh, events are taking place. And that comes back to digital capability and digital identity. If we can go to the next slide, please. So with this growing demand, um, and ensuring that these benefits are being realized. There's huge opportunities that are possible for uh, the integration and to be able to have rapid log on as yourself within all of these systems. And this also means that you can also provide uh, greater uh, integration and interoperability of data if you can get into these systems in a seamless way. And that could mean supporting transitions in care or uh, acknowledging different needs in different sectors of care, or essentially just ensuring that there's effective communication that's taking place of critical data, right down to making sure that meds are being given on time, uh, allergies are being acknowledged, observations are being put in. But at the bottom of all of it is, can you get into the device seamlessly and quickly, and is it taking healthcare staff to where they need to go? I think with that, I'm going to transition. Is it over to you, Andy, or Victor? I'm not quite sure which. Uh, uh, Victor's joined now, so it's it's Victor that's going to be Fantastic. taking us forward, Vic. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. I, I apologize. Uh, we had a couple of uh, difficulties connecting. I am the uh, mobil uh, global mobility specialist from provider for both our Android and iOS solutions. So thank you for joining. Um, next slide. Andy? Yeah. So, you know, in healthcare, as uh, you have heard, obviously, um, clinical side of end user experience, the ability to manage mobile devices and environment is really important. Whether you have a, an Apple device or you have a, an Android device, the objective is to be able to mobilize your clinical teams and make them very efficient and proficient. So if you can build out the slide, Andy, um, the objective of our mobile solutions, beyond what we've done with our tap and go solution today, which is you know walking up to a desktop, initiating a session, right? And being able to sign on, have that single sign on experience, and make it very simple for the clinician. We've taken that same experience and we've moved it to mobile. And in doing so, we need to be able to provide the same capabilities, which is 
we want to be able to improve the quality of care by reducing the burden on the clinician, right? Reduce the burnout, the amount of time it takes for clinicians to sign in to applications to make that more seamless. Um, obviously, there's regulatory compliance that we need to address, right? Um, and we want to reduce the administrative overhead. So the solution be simple and easy to use. It should not be uh, difficult or uh, cost prohibitive. And then ultimately, this is, should lower your operating costs. That's the objective. Have a solution that's easy and simple to use. The clinicians will adopt uh, in the environment, but also lower your operating costs from both a clinical and IT perspective. Next slide. So we are Improvod as a digital identity company. That's probably what you know uh, us mostly for, but we really also ha are a mobile company. I came, I have about 11 years of mobility experience, which we brought in with the acquisition of ground control about two years ago. And so we have a whole mobile team dedicated to both, you know, building out the product, making the integration uh, more seamless, right? And so plugging in mobile into what we've done already with digital identity is uh, part of um, what we provide in a seamless mobile solution. But there are other pieces of your mobile initiative um, that wrap around what we do, right? And they're very key because in order to deploy our mobile solution, um, you need to address all the other important factors. So we understand what all these factors are. We help uh, recommend and address um, where and when uh, you should be doing certain things in your environment, right? So if you look at cases and docs and MDM, right? The architecture and design, the types of devices you use, how you provision them, and the mobile tech technical expertise you need behind it. This is where we can lend expertise as part of an overall mobile project. Next slide, Andy. So how do we do this? And we're going, you're going to see this in a video. We're going to, um, we're going to communicate both the Android workflow and the iOS workflow, which is just to see on screen, if you were to take both our solutions side by side, we have a very similar experience of using a badge, right? And which you're using today, most likely in your environment, right? With one sign and be able to utilize that badge with either an Android device. We have many manufacturers, Zebra, Ascom, Spectralink, Samsung, they all work um, for the most part on all those devices, right, with your badge tab. But on the iOS side, a little slightly different architecture, which means you can't badge tap the back of the device. Uh, Apple doesn't permit that. So we have a docking station approach that allows you to tap a badge on a docking station and be able to run through a clinical workflow that will check out a device and check in a device and allow the users, the clinical users, to be able to have this password, uh, very free password injection into apps to give that single sign-on experience. So next slide, I think we can show the video at this point. And this will be Android first that we're going to demonstrate. And if you are in your environment, if you have one sign already and you have your badge, we're demonstrating uh, in this one in case on an ASCOM device, this is the lock screen. Um, you need your badge to be able to tap the back and be able to authenticate in to the device, launch an application or applications based on what's provisioned and this will basically sign you into the application automatically, right, with your username and password without having to credential in independently. And once again, this is for every application. And then when you tap the back of the device, it will, it will log you out. Um, and then at this point, the next individual comes with their badge, they tap in, and what that's done is log the other individual completely out of everything right, to protect your privacy and allows this new user to have the same login experience, be able to access your applications. Um, and then once again, if you tap the back of the device, it would log this individual out as well. So this is how you have to do fast user switching between users, um, but also protect the data on the device and allow this seamless workflow. So that is Android and, and how we do uh, fast user switching, but also allow for that single sign-on experience and seamless clinical workflow. And then we're gonna switch over to the iOS version. So this is the look and feel on iOS. Once again, these devices, 
or in a doc. Um, and you can see here, this is my home environment. Um, I have several devices, iPads, iPhones sitting in this dock. And the objective here is that you can have any type of iOS device in this style or type of dock, which will permit you to be able to mix and match. Different cases uh, are supported via different cable types that are locked down into the dock, as well as the iPads. So you can see here different iPhones, uh, different makes and models. And once again, I have an iPad in here as well. I have an Android device actually charging in here so you can charge your non-iOS devices um, in the same dock. And the objective is we pick up a badge the same way we did before, and we're gonna tap the badge on the badge reader. And that is going to go out and it's going to authorize the user. Right? And it's gonna flash a blinking white light, which is the clinical workflow. Which device do I pick up? The one that blinks white, because that is got the best battery health. We're checking the devices to ensure which device has the best battery health. And then we provision that device with the person's name um, and set it up like it's a one-to-one -one device, even though it's being shared. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to screen share the user experience. So what does it look like after I tap my badge and I unplug my device? What is the user experience for logging into applications as well as some of the other additional features we have on iOS? So you can see up on the left side, we're screen mirroring um, and at the actual device that we tapped into right, and checked out. And you can see the look and feel. The individual is on the front of the screen um, so we know how to identify who the user was that checked the device out. And we've also asked to put a, a four digit code to protect this device and assign it to the user. So here as a second step in the workflow is, and this is optional, is we're adding a passcode function. And once again, this locks the device to the user if they misplace it, they set it down. No one has access to this device, it's locked down to you. So the next step here would be that we want to launch an application on the device. And depending on what applications you, or applications you're using, the objective here is, is that you should be able to launch an app and be able to seamlessly sign in as you've done on the Android side as well. All right, so we're going to launch an application here and you're gonna actually see how this runs through the process. And the other additional things that we have on the device is also a couple of apps that, that handle asset tracking and management as well. And we're gonna just, um, there we go. I think the video is just running a little slow today. There we go, launch the app. So I launched my app, I don't have to credential in. That's what would happen if you didn't have our solution, you have to put a username and password. But following a typical workflow, right, I would put in my Active Directory passcode. That's my second factor authentication to tie me and my badge to me as a user. And that's the only time you have to do this at the beginning of the shift. So I tap my badge, right? And then the second element was to put in your passcode and that's it, you're done. These are all the apps that I have on my device that I have this password autofill capabilities. So it'll actually put, and you're gonna, you can't see this in screen sharing, but it actually puts the username and password into the app. And this is true of any application. It's also true that every app, whether it times out via the device or the application server will automatically allow that uh, credentialing in. Second feature is a self heal function launch an app, press a button, and plug it back in. And what it's doing, it's notifying field service and support that this device um, is, um, is not operational, we need a new device. So you tap your badge, you pick another device, and field services knows what device is inoperable and can attend to it. The third app is a asset tracking app. So this allows us to track what devices are taken, which ones are checked out, which ones have not been returned, and which ones are overdue. And then we can address this and make the individuals accountable for these devices, right? If they return the next day on a shift, 
um, you haven't returned a device, you want to check out another device. So this is how we reduce loss management. We also reduce the spare pool requirements um, and keeps everyone accountable. So we're going to return this device back at the end of my shift. I'm done. Do I want to be able to just plug my device in and walk away. So the apps that you have, we want to make sure will automatically log out. A uh, function of single sign-on is signing in, but it's also signing out. Otherwise, users manually have to sign out, which is not a very clean workflow. So we ensure that the applications you're using will sign out, talk to the uh, application server, ensure these devices are signed out of each app. We're going to disassociate the device and the user um, at this point, and then we're going to lock up this device. It's going to be in a software lock state which means you start in this state, but you also end in this state. So no one can indiscriminately pick up a device um, and walk away with it because it's bricked, right? You need a badge to check it out. You plug it in, it's gonna lock up and, and move back to that same state. And this is what you see, the device is locked. That's the state that it returns to after you check the device in. So slightly similar workflows between Android and iOS. You have a few additional capabilities on iOS with the acid tracking and the cell heal functions, but that is uh, the clinical workflows to make it simple, make it easy, right? Reduce the burden on the clinicians and ensure that the clinicians will adopt these uh, devices within the environment, make it simple and easy. So with that, um, I'm gonna I think I'm gonna pass back to either Andy or... It's yes, it's passing back to me, Vic. Sure, Andy. So let's just so that that brings to an end the the improvider section here, and um, I'm going to pass over to Paul Lewis. Um, just um, just bear with me a moment, Andy. A couple of questions came in there, which I think might just be quite helpful to address those. Um, just to finish off Victor's bit, so yeah, Victor, you, you pretty much answered one of them. There's a question here from Brian about. The, the, the mobile devices lock out after a certain time of not being used. So obviously you showed us about the locking when they're docked. Can you also set policy so that they time out as well? Absolutely. Your device timeout's driven by MDM, right? So if you take as an example uh, a five or 10 minute uh, device lockout, right? Uh, devices will lock up. You'll need that passcode to get back in. If the application server, because typically you have both, has a timeout, your, your, your medical record system. That could be 30 minutes, that could be an hour, right? So you have two different timeouts, one for the device and one for the application server. Either way, whether it's the device timing out or the application server timing out, you still have that seamless. You just relaunch the app and it's gonna credential you back in. So it does not impact the user at all during the entire ship. Great. Um, and again, uh, related to what you just said, uh, the sec second question from Brian, uh, does this solution act as a full MDM solution, which you can use to deploy apps and policies using it? We work in conjunction with MDM, but we don't replace it, right? So whatever we're, uh, MDM that you have, we work with about nine different MDMs today, most of the leading MDMs in the market, but we communicate back and forth with MDMs. And you, when you actually tap your badge, as an example, quick uh, I think overview is that we communicate with MDM and we ask, okay, here's the user, what group are they in, right? As a simple example. And then that's how we have personalized the device, what restrictions, what profiles, what apps should they have, where should they look and feel on that device. So we're communicating with MDM in the background, we're doing that in seconds, right? So most, most of the things that are done are done because uh, we're the middleware connecting to the device, but we still need a communication to the MDM to be able to understand what users are in what groups and how they get personalized. Great stuff. Thank you. Okay. Um, there, are, there are a couple more questions that have come in. Um, I'll address those at the end. Um, so please do keep the questions coming in because I'm pretty sure we'll have some time to go through them at the end. I'll monitor those as we continue. Uh, but for now, uh, Paul, I'm going to pass you the keyboard and mouse control. Thank you again, Paul, for joining us today. And um, yeah, I know that this is going to be interesting for a lot of our attendees. So over to you, please, Paul. Yeah, welcome, Andy. Uh, yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me just get onto that first slide. <clears throat> is that working? Yeah, so uh, yeah, good afternoon everyone. So little introduction, so my name is Paul Lewis. I'm a server and desktop infrastructure specialist based at 
um, University Hospitals of Markham Bay. Um, so I've been in the NHS for around about 22 years, uh, where I started as an apprentice, got permanent employment as a second line engineer, and then moved on to our third line team, which I'm still part of now. So a lot to manage, a lot to do, which takes us on to <clears throat> the sort of geographic re uh, region of where we manage. So we operate three main hospital sites. Uh, so there's Furnace General Hospital, which is in Barrow, and we've got uh, Westmoreland General Hospital, which is in Kendall, and Lancaster, uh, Lancaster Infirmary. So it's around about 8,000 staff, um, which we provide services to, excluding community staff, GPs, other healthcare premises within Cumbria Lancashire. So probably between eight and 9,000 staff. Um, so there's a lot, uh, there's, there's a lot to manage, and it's with more bulk kit now. It's becoming um, even, even, even more. We're rolling it out on a daily basis. <clears throat> so, what is our MDM solution? So we currently use uh, Workspace One for our MDM solution, which was formerly AirWatch. Um, we've got around 1,900 iOS devices, but that's probably increased by two or 300 over last week. Um, 300 Android devices enrolled. Um, devices are either configured as a one-to-one -one device or to set up as a shared device um, for a ward, for example. Um, we fully integrate it with Apple's business manager, so our suppliers um, can automatically push devices into the DEP for us. Um, we also have a team of developers that create apps so that we can distribute them to devices without the need for Apple ID, Google Play account, anything like that. Um, and we also use Apple Business Manager to deploy public apps to devices through Workspace ONE, also without the need for any Apple ID. Um, <clears throat> we integrate Workspace ONE with our on-prem Active Directory um, for ease of enrollment. So we just drop users into certain groups and stuff and it'll sync up to the MDM solution so we can easily deploy devices. So why are we looking at ground control? So um, we all recognize the, the, the picture in the slide. Um, so bleeps or pages as they're known have, have been around for a long time. And I think it was in 2019, the government announced that all NHS trusts need to be rid of such outdated technology by 2021, 2022. So <clears throat> we've easily said goodbye to things like fax machines, trusty pager has, has proved a bit more problem problematic. Um, so it was essential that whatever we were going to use to replace the pager was not only user friendly for our staff, but also had to be safe for the patients. So we decided to use ground control and iPhone 11s uh, with, an, uh, with an app that's been developed that allows staff to assign um, a task or bleep to a clinician if they're on shift. The task will come through to the iPhone in the form of like a push notification um, and then can be dealt with. Uh, at the start of each shift, each clinician will tap their NHS smart card against the proximity reader. An iPhone will be checked out from ground control to them for a maximum of seven days we've, we've allowed them to check a device out for. Uh, they can't check out another device unless the previous device has been returned. Um, the iPhone will have all the apps they need pre-installed and will automatically connect to the trust Wi-Fi, uh, secure Wi-Fi network. Um, once a device is checked back in via ground control, it will run a full device swipe and configure itself for the next person to check out. <clears throat> so it makes it uh, a slick process for the clinician to use. So what does it look at, like? So we've recently just rolled out um, 10 docking stations and around about 200 iPhones. So the uh, each designated area on a ward will have a, a charge and sync station. Um, with 20 mini lightning cables, um, up to 20 iPhone 11s. Um, behind that, there's a there's a small form factor Windows 10 PC. There's no keyboard, mouse or screen needed. It automatically logs in, automatically starts the ground control software and uh, get, does everything it needs to with the devices. And then purely there's just a proximity reader there for the tap on, tap off feature so um, it's very tidy set up for, for, the, for the end user there's no um, 
trailing wires or PCs, keyboard mice in the way or anything like that. So um, we we try and hide everything as, as away as much as we can. Um, it's quite a slick slick solution. <clears throat> so what's the um, so so how does a clinician actually check out a device? So uh, it, it's a simple process. Uh, so once they've been through a one-time enrollment, so we've got some enrollment kiosks. They go through a one-time enrollment to to enroll their Active Virtual account against their uh, smart card. Uh, they will tap their NHS smart card. The smart card is checked against uh, the Improvata one sign appliance that we have to ensure the card is enrolled for the user. Um, if it hasn't been enrolled, it, the, 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 um, RFI, uh, the proximity reader will bleep several times and then alert to us that they, they someone's tried to check out the device and not be configured, um, at which point we would direct them to an enrollment uh, station. Um, that then, uh, so if one sign's happy, that the user details okay, it passes the request to the ground control to check out a device to a user. So the whole process takes less than 10 seconds. Device is identified to the user um, in the form of the first name, surname on the screen, unplug it and walk away. And they've got the, the phone on the Wi-Fi with the apps that they need, um, pre-configured, ready to go. So what do we see as the as the benefits of, of of ground control well we've got full asset management really historically we've given devices towards admin areas no one takes any accountability as to where they are especially if they're set up for a, a, as a shared device um you know we've probably all gone into wards open a drawer and seen share uh, ipads iphones just just shut away because no one has any accountability for them. Um, <clears throat> so ground control assigns a user to each device and gives us the ability to see who has what device checked out and when. Um, as I said previously, we also limit the user to only be able to check out one device at any one time. Um, to follow on from that, it gives us a full audit trail of a device, so successful check-ins, check-outs, any issues that have occurred uh, on the device. Um, it, it, the uh, ground control allows us to implement um, like smart workflows. Um, very straightforward to change any settings that you want to push to the devices. Um, so we've also taken a decision, as I said previously, to perform a full device wipe on check-in. Um, it takes a little longer for the iPhone to become available again, but we then know the device has had everything stripped off from it, from the previous user, any, any accounts for Teams, for example, email accounts, all that sort of stuff is, is, is all gone. And <clears throat> lastly, it's also given us the ability to keep devices up to date as iOS versions can be pushed out automatically um, once a device is checked in. So it doesn't affect anyone during a, the, a, sh a shift of the phone. So, um, you know, we've, we've had devices out on the wards for many years never kept up to date with ios updates and things like that very difficult to 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 find, pinpoint where they are and get them updated ground control can take care of all that based on the fact that you can do an ios update as soon as the device is checked in so it's a very slick process and keeps up all your devices on the same ios level um yeah straightforward enough so that is that is it from me. Like I said, there's only a few slides. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Um, and I just also like to say that we've actually just gone live with this today um, to three hospital sites, um, and our staff are currently, as we speak, checking out phones and checking in phones, um, and it's 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 working it's working very well. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Excellent, thank you, Paul. I mean, that that's it's just a really nice, interesting use case, and hopefully very relevant for the attendees on the call. And uh, yeah, very very well presented. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, just reviewing the questions, um, we've already answered a few of them. I'm just trying to go through. So uh, one from Michael, uh, probably for Victor, is there geofencing within this? There is no geofencing um, with, uh, as an example with Paul here, he has Workspace ONE. So you do have the ability to um, what we call breadcrumbing. If the device is say taken out of the uh, hospital, um, as an example, you can actually, and it's still on Wi-Fi or some type of network, 
um, you can see the last known location and then ground control can tell workspace one to trigger loss mode. It's also available on a couple other MDMs and that will brick the device and look for the last known location. There is some solutions that do geolocation services in a hospital it becomes much more difficult because you have to triangulate um, between access points to get a kind of a, a, a relative position of that device. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, how do you determine which apps are available for the different roles? So, yeah, uh, it's up to, I mean, uh, Paul is actually wiping a device completely, yeah. right? But uh, we have the ability to st we stage. The other method is keep all the apps and everything that you need on the device when it's staged and it's staged to uh, as a standard user in the doc. So when you tap your badge, we look up what group you're in in MDM. So Workspace One is probably one of the better MDMs and it has the ability with an API to say, I want to assign this device to this user, right? Um, and in those cases, we can personalize the device through that API. Uh, not every M MDM can perform this function, but Workspace One is one of the few that can. And then yes, you can pick and choose how the look and feel of that device is going to be. There's other ways of doing it. Um, with other MDMs, so it requires a follow-up conversation, right? And get into more detail about how we perform that function. Yeah, that makes sense, thank you. Um, this looks to be the last question for now, so if there are any more, please fire them in quickly. Uh, but the final one from Simon, um, uh, what about if a staff member forgets to check in the device? Uh, does, does it automatically do this after a set period of time? So in the console, there is a uh, configurable value. As an example, you have a 10 hour shift, most likely put in 11 hours, uh, give the clinician time to get off their shift and, and return a device, that device to a doc. That's another conversation because we are flexible in where it's returned. Um, but at that 11th hour, we would trigger notifications. And notif one of the abilities is trigger a notification to IT field service support the department manager, so they're aware this device was not returned, um, and then they have visibility. The second thing was what we showed in the video uh, is there's an app, so department managers would know what devices are overdue and haven't been returned. Um, so if the individual comes back in the next day for their shift, at that point they would be addressed, right, and kept accountable that the devices come back. And once again, as we all know, that impacts your loss management and your spare bool that's needed in order to keep that volume of devices at those levels in those different departments. Great stuff, thanks again, Victor. Um, so yeah, I think that's everything we need to cover today in terms of content. Uh, just finally from me, um, thanks again for everyone for joining, to our panelists for talking and for the large number of attendees that joined us today. Um, we would be extremely grateful if you would complete the survey, which will be served immediately after we end the webinar. Um, so yeah, give us your feedback. Let us know if there's any follow-up questions or just general feedback on today, that'd be great. Um, also, we will be distributing a recording of the webinar if any of you would like to share that. And obviously, contact me uh, using the details here if there's anything else that you'd like to discuss. But yeah, uh, for now, thanks again, and we we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you.